Yeah, we, at our last discussion, I guess it was two weeks ago, um, Bill Burgess suggested that it might be useful to um, have a general discussion of socialism um, in order to situate what people were doing in relationship to that concept. Um, and uh, he asked if I would do it, and I agreed. And um, the, he neglected at the time to say that he was going to be in Ontario. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, so I thought that what I would do is, is uh, make a few remarks, uh, you know, well, more than a few, uh, as an introduction, but basically to try to open up a discussion. Um, and um, what I agreed to try to do is, is talk about uh, socialism, especially with respect to the arguments I make in the book, um, and its links to, to current struggles, um, different types of struggles which are occurring within capitalism. And I think that anyone who talks about um, socialism uh, in the 21st century has to start you know, from the recognition that 20th century socialism, to a very substantial extent, ended in what Marx called, at one point, a miserable fit of the blues. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it doesn't offer much of a vision, um, much of a vision that can attract you know, people, uh, young militants, you know, that uh, are not going to be attracted to that vision of the 20th century uh, socialism. But we need a vision. We need a vision, you know, if people are to commit themselves to struggle to you know, for an alternative to capitalism. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do, you know, in, in this book, which is to emphasize, you know, the, you know, characteristics of socialism, um, which can furthermore function as a, as a vision for the future, which can, you know, help people to struggle. Um, First of all, though, I think that uh, it's useful to, to criticize or identify, or, well, criticize two uh, sacred cows. Um, one is to note that the conception of socialism in, you know, that I'm arguing for uh, is not you know, what it is not. And it's not you know, a concept of socialism which is the lower stage of you know, post-capitalist society. Um, you know, a, a lower stage, which this is what the sacred texts of the 20th century say, you know, that socialism is the lower stage of communist society and the higher stage is communism, um, and that you move from this lower stage to this higher stage through the development of productive forces. Um, and um, that, you know, that's how you surpass this, uh, this inadequate stage. Um, and so, you know, that's when you get to the wonderful world, you know, where uh, everything is possible um, and through the development of the productive forces, um, and you know, all the things that you have denied yourself, like you know, worker participation, um, like community de democracy, um, like distribution in accordance with need. All of these things will be true once you develop the productive forces, um, and if you have that particular conception, almost anything goes for developing the productive forces. You can have gulags. You can have, um, you know, uh, a focus on self-interest of people. Um, you can have, in fact, capitalism, you know, because capitalism will help you develop the productive forces. Um, and, you know, that is not at all the conception of socialism that I, you know, start from. And I would argue it's not the conception of socialism of Marx. And as, you know, David said, you know, uh, I do, in fact, go back to an, a much earlier conception of socialism. It's Marx's conception. I think that, that every, everything I'm doing is rooted in Marx and Marx's work. Um, so I, that's one sacred cow that I think I want to identify. Another is to note that it's wrong to say that Marx talked only about capitalism and not socialism. Um, if you look at Marx's capital, the book, you know, it's filled with comments which refer to the alternative society. Um, and that's most obvious when Marx talks about what he calls the inverse situation, in contrast to capitalism, the inverse situation where the means of production are used to satisfy the workers' own need for development. In other words, the concept of the workers have a need for development. Um, and when Marx uses that term inverse situation, it's a fascinating concept because then it can, you know, you can then say, well, is this society the inverse of capitalism? How often does he talk about inverse? you know, inversions, etc. And if it goes to Marx's capital, you find him over and over again talking about 
the capitalist inversion. Uh, how capitalism inverts the relationship between means of production and human beings. Instead of human beings using means of production for, for hum human needs, in fact, means of production employ the worker to satisfy the growth of means of production. Uh, if you look at Marx, you know, Marx's capital from the perspective of in the, this inverted society, invert the inversion, um, which is capitalism, you can see a very clear perspective on, on the concept of this alternative society. And underlying this, the underlying theme, you know, uh, that runs through capital, but not only capital, um, you know, throughout Marx's work, is this conception on, of human development. Uh, and that's the subtitle of, of, of the book, which is Real Human Development. Um, this whole concept of the development of the capacities of human beings. Uh, the rich human being Marx talked about in one of his early works is a person who was able to develop, you know, her capacities, her, you know, all her potential. Uh, and he contrasted that in 1844 to this idea of uh, we throw aside this idea of the wealth and poverty that the political economists talk about, and we talk instead about the rich human being. Well, that rich human being is a person who develops these capacities. And if you look, you, you read through Marx's work, you see this constant focus on this ability to develop one's capacity. Not only you know, do you see it in, you know, in this concept of the worker's own need for development, which surfaces in his work Capital, but you also see it in the Communist Manifesto. You see it in the draft of the manifesto that Engels wrote, which talks about the creating a society in which everyone is able to develop their capacities and their potential, uh, which was a common conception in 19th century socialism. Um, but you also see it in Marx's draft, well, his final version of the Communist Manifesto, where he talks about this concept of development. Human development is interdependent, which says explicitly the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. That's the society in which people can develop. That's the goal. Um, and you, know, you also see this concept coming back over and over again, in, in, in even the, uh, the critique of the Gotha program, which is often you know, identified as a place where Marx talks about the need for people to have material incentive. In fact, Marx criticizes that concept of material incentive in the Gotha program and says that's looking at people one-sidedly as workers and not as human beings with their needs. Um, so you have that concept of a rich human being which, which permeates Marx, so much so that when you understand that for Marx, human wealth is in fact the development of human capacities, you then can read Marx's Capital in its opening line which says, the wealth in societies which are dominated by the capitalist mode of production appears as an immense collection of commodities. In other words, wealth appears as commodities, not as real human wealth, which is people who have developed their capacities. Furthermore, it's also clear that this concept of human development for Marx does not come as a gift. Um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't come as somebody providing you with the opportunity for human development. You know, it only occurs through the activity of people, through the participation of people, through the protagonism of people, uh, through their struggles, and that's certainly something Marx constantly talks about, but through all their activities, their day-to-day -day activities, and that's the concept of the, you know, that Marx introduces in an early you know, set of notes, the theses on Feuerbach, in which he talks about you know, the concept of revolutionary practice, the simultaneous changing of circumstances and human activity or self-change. Uh, you know, that people develop by changing circumstances, by acting upon circumstances. Um, they transform <coughs> nature and transform themselves simultaneously. Um, so, you know, if you go back to that early you know, note on uh, Marx's note on the theses on Feuerbach, in fact, it's fine. What he's saying is, you know, he's saying in this whole concept of the development of this idea of, of revolutionary practice, of the simultaneous changing of self and circumstances, what is he criticizing? He's criticizing, you know, Robert Owens, the, the whole concept of someone will create a society and give you gifts, you know, from above. Um, yeah, it's like Fidel said you know, a few years ago, I think it was 2005, uh, that you know, this idea that you know, we think that somebody has created, knows how to build socialism, you know, uh, we thought that you know, they, they had the answer to how to build socialism. Socialism did not come as a gift. Um, so in this context, you know, let me say something about 
socialism for the 21st century. The conceptions that are emerging in Latin America in particular. The idea of human development at the center and of human development only occurring through practice and participation is something which, which can be seen very clearly in the Bolivarian Constitution of Venezuela. Uh, something developed, uh, you know, which was um, uh, accepted or, or voted on um, in 1999. Um, a very key focus on, on the concept of human development. I sort of cite the sections in the Constitution which talk about, you know, uh, the whole goal is the overall human development. That's the goal of the society. Um, the f and I'll just give you some exact quotes here. Um, in, in terms of the, uh, yeah, let me just find this. <coughs> well, I don't think I'm going to find it. I should have made the, the note as to where. The, oh, yeah. Uh, so Article 299 says the goal of a human society is that of ensuring overall human development. Article 20 says everyone has the right to the free development of his or her own personality. And Article 102 says the focus is on developing the creative potential of every human being and the full exercise of his or her personality in a democratic society. Not only is this a key theme in, in the Constitution, it's also a theme, you know, the, also part of that theme is how that human development occurs. And very explicitly, they talk about protagonism, uh, participation, um, the participation, for example, by people in forming, caring, and controlling the management of, of public affairs is the necessary way of achieving the involvement to ensure their complete development, both individual and collective. In other words, the necessary way. It doesn't happen in the absence of that participation, in the absence of protagonism. Uh, and the, the Constitution also stresses co-management, participation, cooperatives, etc., as all part of this process by which people develop their, their human capacities. Now, that's constitutions. We know constitutions can say anything. You know, um, the real question is, is there any attempt to put this into practice? And there certainly is an attempt. It's a struggle, you know, but there certainly is an attempt in Venezuela. Um, for example, you know, if you look at, at some of the developments in Venezuela, you'll see that there's a very significant emphasis on what are called the communal councils. Now, the communal councils are, you know, bodies, local bodies, uh, containing, you know, between 100 and 200 families, um, and um, so small units, uh, they could even be, you know, an apartment house, um, and these units, these communal councils uh, in the urban areas, um, will, in fact, be provided with funds to undertake projects like street repair, water systems, etc., like that. In the countryside, um, the, they can be as small as 20 families. Um, so you have, you know, very small units which are involve, you know, significant participation by people. Um, these uh, units, these communal councils, have as their general decision-making body the whole assembly. It's the whole neighborhood, effectively, which is involved in making decisions. They elect spokespersons, voceros, you know, to, you know, to speak on behalf of, of the community on specific issues. But they're not elected representatives. They are simply spokespersons. They are the voice. The, that's the concept of the vocero. They're the voice of the community on these questions. Now, obviously, a communal council, which can, you know, in the urban areas have, you know, represent a maximum, say, of a thousand people, you know, can't do a lot, you know, of major decision making. They're, they're dealing with their local communities. So one has to see that there is another step that's involved in this, which is the idea of bringing together communal councils um, to combine them to work on issues of common, you know, concern. So a water system, for example, something that's going to transcend one simple communal council. So that's the process. There are, there are about, I'm trying to remember, maybe about 35,000 know, you communal councils in, in Venezuela at this point. Some of them function really well. Some of them don't function very well. And, and largely the explanation as to why some function well and some don't is their own histories. 
um, you know, did they have activism before, or were they, you know, passive communities that had no history of working together on, on different struggles like land, you know, uh, title, or uh, health committees, or defense committees, or things of that sort. All of those old, you know, uh, movements uh, that have existed in communities have all come together uh, within the communal councils. The communal councils, though, all these little, you know, communal councils, are now in a process of combining, uh, maintaining their own integrity as communal councils, but combining to the point where they form maybe 10 communal councils, maybe 20, I think that's the largest number I can recall hearing, into what are called communes. So the commune becomes a unit uh, which you know, now organizes on larger issues, uh, larger projects. And the logic of the communes, as they are developing, and there's, this is a process develop, development happening right now, is the logic of the, 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 the commune is then to move to a next stage, which would be the combining of communes into what is called the communal city. Um, so what you have, in fact, is the development, the concept of the development of a state from below, uh, a state which is, you know, without question, a very democratic state, um, and Chavez himself is very clear on this conception of what is involved in this because he constantly refers to the communal council as the cell of a new socialist state. Uh, that we are creating a new socialist state and we start it at the local community in this way. 